about CAO, CAO council relationships, tensions and synergies between the roles. Who would have thought there were tension and synergies and how to make the most of them? My name is Chi Ying Ho. I'm with WCS Engagement and Planning and I'm sitting here in what we are, what we know as Whistler, um, but we are on the traditional shared unceded territories of the Liwat and Squamish nations. And I'd like to thank our First Nations um, partners for allowing us to, to live and work and play on their lands. So let me just talk about the format for this webinar and then I'll, I'll introduce our panelists. So this is a webinar format. You'll notice that uh, the chat has been disabled to keep you all focused, uh, but the question and answer is enabled. So if you have questions, as questions come to mind during this discussion, please type them in and we will try to address as many as possible. And if we don't end up addressing them during the webinar, I'm going to ask our panelists to please respond and we'll email, it, I'll email the responses back to everyone who's on the webinar. So um, as I mentioned, it's a webinar format, so it's mostly presentation um, and our panelists speaking. We have Professor David Siegel of Brock University, who's going to tell us about his research and writing about CAO and counselor relationships and how to improve them, especially around governance around wicked problems such as climate change. Then we'll hear from personal experiences of our rock star panel, our former CAO and, and current and former elected officials. This will be a question and answer format where I'll be asking questions and the panelists will be responding with their personal experiences and thoughts. My lovely assistant and the amazing person who is making these, webinar hap these webinars happen, Alex Lidstone. Please show your face, Alex. There she is. Thanks, Alex. Alex will be monitoring the questions and as I mentioned, we'll try to respond to as many as possible. Alex also has a few words to say at the end of the webinar um, before we sign off, but Alex has been instrumental in pulling these together. So um, first of all, I'll introduce our panelists. We first have David Siegel. David has recently retired after a 41 year career teaching political science at Brock University. During his time at Brock, he also held various administrative positions such, such as associate vice president, dean of two faculties and the chair of his department. He has written extensively in the areas of public administration and local government and his latest book is Leaders in the Shadows, the leadership qualities of municipal chief administrative officers. He's right, retired now, still consults, but he's mostly spending time cycling, attending concerts, plays, and I guess baseball games pre-COVID. We also has, have Ruth Molly. Ruth has over 30 years experience in local government leadership. She is proud to, be this, to have been the CAO of a small municipality in BC, Ladysmith, that has been recognized for livability and sustainability. During her tenure as CAO, the town received numerous provincial and national awards, particularly with respect to advancements in environmental sustainability, including annual recognition as one of Canada's green employers. Nice to see you, Ruth. And Maya, Maya Tate. Maya is the mayor of Souk. We've seen her lots around UBC and FCM stuff. Uh, Maya was first elected to council in 2008, served two consecutive terms, and is currently serving her second term as mayor. She also served as past president of UBCM, meaning that she was president. I guess you're currently serving as past president, and she's also a past board member of FCM. While serving in office, Maya has been honored to represent the interests of Souk residents on various panels throughout the region and the province, and way too numerous to list, but just a few things representing um, health, parks and rec, regional transit, and First Nations relations. So very, um, very involved in, in all kinds of things. And Donna McDonald. Donna was first elected to Nelson City Council in 1988 and served as a counselor for 19 years um, with some breaks until she retired in 2014. She worked with not one, not two, but four different CAOs, five different mayors, and innumerable, innumerable counselors. 
In 2016, Donna's memoir about her local government experience called Surviving City Hall was published. Since then, she's made many well-received presentations throughout BC to community members and elected officials. So you see we have an amazing panel of very experienced CAO and CAOs and elected officials, and it will be really interesting to hear um, their experiences in relation to what David's going to talk about. So as mentioned, I'll be asking the panelists a series of questions, and I do apologize ahead of time if I do need to discreetly cut you off um, to make sure that everyone has a chance to respond to the questions and we also want to get through all the as many questions as possible as well as allow time for panelists to ask their questions okay so giving you the warning that i might cut you off um, but we want to make sure that everybody has a chance to provide your uh, experiences because i think it'll be super interesting so we'll first start off with david um, being the author of this very intriguing book so david i'm curious to know why you started writing on this subject of horizontal leadership. What were a couple of the most common problems you've seen in CAO and elected official relationships that you felt were impeding change or effectiveness of local government? Uh, well, first of all, I'm really pleased to uh, have the opportunity to be here. And I'm, I'm uh, you know, you kind of uh, put a lot of pressure on us when you say this is the first webinar in, the, in your group. I, uh, I'm a little humbled at the opportunity to, to do this. Um, I wanted to write about council staff relations, and I've done quite a bit of work in that area because this is one of the most important relationships in getting things done. Uh, the relationship between the council, which makes the policy decisions, and the CAO, who is responsible for carrying those out. And I think one of the major uh, things, I'm going to talk about a couple of things that uh, are important in that relationship. One is for each group of people to understand what their role is. The role of counselors is to represent the general public to be sure that the local political culture is represented in the decisions that are made. The role of staff uh, is to uh, provide the expertise. They are the experts in, you know, engineering and planning and uh, uh, recreation and, and things like that. And the best decisions are made when both of those groups are uh, involved in making the decision because you need decisions that are reflected in the, uh, uh, have the expertise of staff but also have the uh, political culture uh, of the local community. Um, and the other thing that's important in this relationship is that, that the people respect one another. Um, and that is seen as a problem by a number of people involved in the, the system right now. Maybe we'll talk about that a bit more, but I'm conscious of uh, uh, your um, uh, uh, idea that you're going to cut us off. So I don't want to uh, monopolize. I want to be sure that the other esteemed uh, people have an opportunity here. <laughs> That's great, David. Um, so those are really, really great distinctions. What are some of the problems you've seen when, when maybe those, those, th those two roles aren't respected? Well, maybe I will start off with uh, what I kind of finished up with, uh, and that is the idea of respect. Um, it is very important that everybody around the council table, whether they are counselors or whether they are staff, uh, respect uh, the other people because everybody has an important role. Sometimes staff will tell counselors things that counselors would rather not hear, okay? Staff have an obligation to speak to counselors uh, and to give them the best professional administrative advice that staff can uh, provide to counselors. And as I say, sometimes that means telling, thing, telling counselors things that counselors would rather not uh, hear. Um, but it's very important in a situation like that that everybody respects the roles of the 
uh, various people. It is the role of staff to provide their best professional administrative uh, uh, advice. And it is the role of counselors to represent citizens. And they want to, they, they need to listen very carefully and thoughtfully to the advice that's provided by staff. But sometimes they'll reject that advice uh, because of uh, other considerations that are important to the community. Um, but that needs to be done in a respectful way. So I think that's an important uh, uh, thing that a lot of people all around the council table are concerned about in the current environment. Thanks, David. And the emphasis on respect is so important and, and understanding the roles and doing things that sometimes are really difficult. You talk about a horizontal leadership. Can you just give an example or an explanation of what exactly you mean by horizontal leadership? Well, there's a natural tendency for organizations, all organizations, including municipalities, to operate on the basis of silos. Uh, you know, we have these operating departments and it's really the only way that you can organize a, a large group of people is in uh, uh, operating departments. But what that means is that there are certain kinds of issues, climate change being the perfect example of things that cross these silos. There are things that are significant in a variety of different silos and it's very easy to lose track of issues like that you know the engineer is very busy uh, looking after the roads and uh, the recreation people are very busy looking after programs and so and that's that's their job that's what they should be doing but somehow in all of this issues like uh, climate change and you know there are other cross-cutting issues like this uh, homelessness um, uh, affordable housing generally. There are a lot of issues uh, like this that are cross-cutting issues that are very important. And in the normal course of things, the silos, they, they don't fit neatly in a silo. So it's, it, it's tough to figure out sometimes the best way to deal with these things. Yeah, and that's so key is, is trying to figure that out because you're so right. So many things do not fit, especially our wicked problems. They don't fit in a silo. So I'm going to turn it over to the panelists now. And, and this is a hard question, but can, and we'll go Donna, then Maya, then Ruth. Can you give us an example of a previous experience or challenge where you were successful in overcoming this governing across silos? What was a specific issue you had to deal with where you were able to get everybody across the different departments or, or um, departments or however you call them in, in your local government, how you got people working together with and, and more horizontal leadership? Donna. <clears throat> um, well, I think as a, as a council counselor in particular, um, you know, it's, I never felt that it was my role to be directive to the CAO, um, that my main role in that was to make sure we hired the, the right CAO with the right personality okay. skills and leadership style and then to support them. Um, I don't think CAOs or other staff appreciate counselors coming in and meddling with what they're doing. So I always tried to avoid that. Um, but saying that, um, I guess I would, um, as a, a couple, couple quick examples, in 2010, we did a, a corporate greenhouse gas reduction plan. So that was looking at the city operations and how we did the, made those reductions. And um, that engaged staff across all the silos because every work site was impacted in some way and you know, was wanting to make changes or having to make changes. And, and so I, that was something that kind of cut across all the silos. We were all in this game together of trying to reduce the, the city's um, emissions. And, and some of the staff took it on um, on their own initiative and you know, would start little friendly competitions between different workplaces um, in, in reducing electricity use or waste, or waste production. Um, but I think the better example, the, the current council um, in 2019 hired a climate change coordinator and she has um, a very collaborative style and both within the city structure and within the community and so she has been working really uh, strongly to to cut across the silos and you know while that 
position was a council initiative to create it, the CAO has a very important role in making sure that her work is supported, that there is collaboration happening and, and, and being welcomed, in fact, and that there aren't blocks coming from the silos saying, no, that's not our job, that's not our job. So I think having that kind of position that cuts across all those silos is very beneficial. Great, thanks, Donna. Maya? Thank you. So similar back in 2009 or 10, uh, at that time, Souk, along with many BC communities, signed on to the Climate Charter. And I was at a workshop with another staff member who I kind of met for the first time there. I was a counselor there, so I didn't know all of the staff all that well. However, at the end of it, when we were chatting, it was the case of, okay, well, what's next? Like, we're both hit with this information, and there was a real call to action at that time. And so I remember we were looking at each other and saying, like, who do we tell? Like, who do we talk to? And it's like, well, everybody, everyone has in all departments has a role to play here. So what is it that staff needs to do? And what does council need to do? So I put forward a notice of motion and I didn't know what to call it other than the formation of a green team, uh, something to that effect. And it got accepted and endorsed at that time, uh, reluctantly it feels, but it still went ahead. And so that's where I think the notice of motion tool is, is very useful to a member of council who wants to advance something. Uh, over the years, of course, different committees came and went and uh, leading to the present council now where we do have a climate action committee that's been doing work over the past years. They put together a wonderful work plan uh, and then it's been back and forth from council to staff getting the funding and the like um, but what was really important at our last council meeting is that we really took the time to go through the recommendations one by one so rather than broadly okay let's endorse it move on and do this and i think if we had done that it may not have been broadly accepted uh, other councillors everyone is at their own place in terms of how they view uh, the crisis out there. So we needed to take time for everyone to feel heard around the table, everyone to give input. So we slowed it down and, and broke it apart um, into separate motions that could come forward. And in the end, they were all endorsed unanimously. So this is sort of all of council working together, all of staff giving input where needed. And I, I think that it led to a really positive outcome in that respect. So again, it's, um, as David said, it's really important to understand the role of staff, the role of council, and uh, where things can go wrong is when one steps into each other's circle. I think I've, I've experienced that where council gets too administrative, too hands-on doing staff work, and then uh, staff get too political, and we, we each have our unique roles to play in, in carrying out the good work of communities. Thank you. Thanks, Maya. Just a quick follow-up question. Who did the green team report to? The green team uh, ended up reporting to council, but also with staff. And at one point, the whole committee was dissolved. Um, the next council came in and, and dissolved the work. However, the good work continued by staff because they're following the science. And so we still managed to achieve corporate neutrality in our operations and a lot of the good work continued because that's the work that they're required to do. So while we may not say they were doing work for climate action, it's, it is all the work. That's why we're building trails. That's why we're, we're engaging young people and, and creating safe egress uh, throughout our community. And even recently, some members of the public criticized us on a parking lot change because the new design is designed for pedestrians to move them safely it's not designed for cars and so that's where sometimes the, there's a clash in the mindset there but it's for people not for vehicles thank you that's a great example and i i just wanted to ask who the green team reported to because it's great to have that cross collaborative um silo busting team but who they report to is as important so it's not just reporting to one general manager they reported directly to council. That's awesome. Ruth. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> when council's given that direction, the CAO obviously is challenged to ensure that the staff are willingly engaged and um, looking for ways to, to deliver on it, but also um, with a recognition that something like that that is so broad kind of sets them up 
to be under a microscope. So how do you support the staff to move forward on things that they may have been thinking about themselves, but haven't had the time or the resources to be able to do it? So we similarly uh, did a green team and uh, we were lucky enough to get somebody to work on a co-op position and she was um, phenomenal. She was very positive. And so she would do things like, you know, after the staff had left at night, go around, put little stickers on the people that had turned off all their computers and just things that were not offensive. You know, they were just recognizing um, that you had done something. So that worked really well. The green team also was not selected by any senior manager. It was uh, completely voluntary. So people could come if it was, the meeting was, you know, half an hour in the morning. So it would be on paid time. But if you weren't a full-time employee, you were still welcome to attend. You just wouldn't be paid. And we found that a lot of people showed up and they had great ideas. And, and I think just being open that there's wisdom throughout the organization. It isn't necessarily at the top levels. Really worked well. And also letting those people share the success. So the CAO wouldn't go for the photo op with the gardens that had been replanted in vegetables, it would be the person who did that with the elected official. And I think that's a really important component of having people be enthusiastic. Like you want them to be ahead of you, not telling them what to do, because you'd never do that, as we know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't work. And, uh, and then what we did was we set that big goal of being um, one of Canada's greenest employers and that was pretty big at the time and a little bit laughable in some ways you know we, we we were we were we had to be pretty brave to do that because you do set yourself up to have a little bit of feedback from people if you're not living it but I think it worked really well because um, we were able we had a single goal everybody knew that that was expected and then a lot of ideas just came out of the woodwork people would be you know, saying, can we try this? Can we do this? And, and, and supporting them and um, letting them have credit. And if there was something that went wrong, then having their back as well. It's really important. Great. Thanks, Ruth. And, and that's really cool about setting that hairy, audacious goal, but achievable that inspired people to all rally together. That's, that's awesome. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna move on to the next question. And first to David, this is about building support. So can you tell us what you've seen to be most effective in building support for climate action or any other wicked problem? When someone might be the sole or minority champion and then they need to win over and create champions of everyone else on council or, and, and or the CAO. I'm sure none of you on this call have ever experienced this, being the sole champion for climate. Uh, but for example, does that qu question make sense, David? Well, it does. And, uh, you know, and your tongue in cheek uh, comment made sense as well, because it can be a lonely uh, position uh, to, to deal with this, because in some ways um, it, it is and has been uh, uh, something that's out, out in front. Uh, I mean, number of years ago, not many people thought about climate change and most, most people denied it. We're now down to uh, hopefully not too many people denying it uh, uh, anymore. Um, I think uh, you, you probably have to work at two levels. Number one, climate change means you wanna make significant changes in the way the world operates. And that's great. You should never forget that. At the same time, you probably have to realize that um, in the immediate uh, surroundings, you're going to have to start with relatively small wins. And small wins can be really uh, effective. I mean, I think what Maya was talking about, creating the sort of radical idea that people walk through parking lots and they should be able to walk or ride their bike through parking lots uh, safely is something that, uh, you know, people don't do this deliberately. They don't deliberately design a parking lot to make it impossible for people pushing a stroller to, to get through the lot. But if nobody reminds them that, hey, you know, some, some people who go to these stores are gonna be pushing strollers and, 
having to carry a bunch of bags. And this is not going to be very convenient for them unless you design something into it. It's just, it's not going to be done. So those kinds of small wins. And you talked about being the only person on council. Sometimes those small wins will allow you to build relationships with other people around the council table or other people in the community. Maybe people aren't really willing at this point to buy into that whole climate change uh, agenda. But, you know, what Ruth was saying about um, uh, uh, commending people who realize that they, they, tr they turn their machines off at the end of the day, uh, that's something that other people might be, somebody might really be able to accept that, um, even if they're a little wary about this grandiose climate change uh, stuff. So, you know, you can build small relationships and the next thing you know, you, you've developed something much, much stronger with a number of people around the table in small ways that you can then build on to something else. Thanks, David. That's such a great reminder. I'm sure all of us on the call are really impatient and wanting things to happen quicker and we want to focus on the big what are the things that make the biggest impact right away but that's such a good reminder about smart, starting with small wins building the relationships around that so i'm going to go to our elected officials and cao and we'll start with maya this time first and then ruth and donna can you give us an example of where you, in your role as elected official or CAO, have been completely at odds with the other? So uh, if you're an elected official, you're completely at odds with the CAO um, in a situation regarding climate action or, or something similar. So for example, you're an elected official, you want the municipality to, to be more aggressive, push harder, go faster, um, more aggressive targets, for example. Uh, but the CAO was pushing back because it's too much work or for whatever reason. How did you move forward getting each other on side and all working together towards a common goal better? So I suppose the example I'll share is more one of human rights. Uh, you may know that um, I, I had my first and only child uh, shortly after I was elected as mayor and uh, needed to take a four month maternity leave, um, obviously, because my son was born. Uh, well, in that time period, um, there was a significant change. Um, some members of council, I guess, thought that I was not going to be returning, even though I had said that I was, which was why I asked for a four month leave. And so I went through, while I was away, I was removed from my regional director position, certain committees that we had in place changed. There was a significant turnover in staff and a new CAO was hired. So as I was working my way back to the office, um, I came in with my son, he was only just over four months. And uh, I was told that I couldn't bring him into the district office. And that, um, you know, it's not a daycare. And of course I'm not expecting staff to look after my son, but he's only four months old. So a little bit surprised by that because it's, you know, 2016 after all. And, uh, and I remember like, well, you, you can't, and even my office had been, um, well, you didn't, don't need one. Uh, we didn't think you were coming back. So I'm like, well, big surprise, here I am. So this is interesting. So, you know, it, it sort of hit a point where, okay, so I went home and thought about that and, and, uh, you know, very supportive husband, you know, like, what is going on? What do I do? And he goes, you go back to work and you bring your son with him, with you, because you have work to do. And so I did that and I said, okay, like, I'm coming in and I need my office space and I'm bringing my son with me. And she said, well, you know, the union will have concerns. I said, well, then the union can file a grievance and I will file a human rights complaint because you can't separate a nursing mother from her child. And, you know, I just suggest you don't persist in this because this is quite an interesting media story. And so it did. Um, and then I also then reached out to other mayors. Uh, the timing was well because the Association of Vancouver Island Coastal Communities 
had uh, their annual con conference. But in the meantime, I started phoning everyone I knew. I phoned my MLA, I phoned the MP, I phoned the leader of the Green Party, I phoned, even reached out to the Premier, who was then Krista Clark's office. I phoned every elected person I could think of, and even, you know, people I knew in business and in law and everywhere, just saying, you know, is this, like, what's going on with the world? What did I miss when I was on mat leave? So I felt that what I was doing was right for women, for minorities, for everyone, you know, Otherwise, what would happen to the human race, right? So, and everything went fine. And I, you know, it was just very clear and professional. Like, I'm not expecting you or any others to babysit my son. However, he's a young baby and he needs to be with me. And so it ended up, um, uh, you know, at AVIC anyway, there was a resolution on pater and maternity and paternal rights for parents, for elected officials that came up and was advanced to UBCM. Uh, and everything over time just seemingly resolved itself. Members of the public came to council that day to see that I was reinstated back to the CRD board. Uh, and so in that case, it's generating um, public um, uh, support. However, council was divided. When I phoned councillors and asked, they were split. They, they didn't necessarily agree. Some did adamantly support me and others didn't. So I didn't quite know uh, where it was going to land in the end. Uh, however, it, it did land. And, and now we have a, um, a parental rights policy in place for our elected officials, because it was important for me that anyone serving afterwards would not have to go through this again. I just find it disturbing that women in this day and age need to ask, like you shouldn't have to ask to have children. It, it's a blessing when you're fortunate to have one. Wow. That's a very interesting story. And thanks for sharing such a personal story, Maya. Um, and thanks for taking one for, for the female um, part of our gender spectrum. <laughs> uh, that's really interesting. And that, that really talks about building those relationships and all that work that you had to do to build those individual relationships that eventually snowballed and, and had the best effect. So congratulations on that. And I'm sorry you had to go through all that, it shouldn't happen. Um, but thanks for moving the dial for everybody else. Okay, uh, Ruth, over to you. Um, yeah, so when I was CIO, I was really fortunate. I didn't have a lot of conflict with council at all. I had lots of support, but um, there were voices on council, council that were hesitant to move too fast. And so, for instance, um, you know, declaring that we were going to build buildings that were going to be lead gold, for instance, um, would be criticized because there's a cost to that. And so um, we worked really hard to try to set up things so that they were lead gold like. So perhaps not making the application right away, but definitely making sure that the building could um, could meet the expectations if we decided to go for that. So sort of ensuring that the timing, if there wasn't support, ensure that you were still doing the right thing. Um, and I think that worked really well because in the beginning, I was actually talking to the former mayor last night and, and he reminded me that in the beginning he was decides for putting in trees which just seems like a no-brainer now, right? And, and you just are um, moving the, the, the discussion along in a way that maybe what's not acceptable today, you're setting the organization up so that what hopefully will be acceptable in the future will have happened in retrospect. And buildings in particular are really important in that discussion. So you don't want to build something in you know, 2015 or whenever it was, that's not going to meet the test of time in 2035. So um, I, I think it's just really important if there is conflict to find ways to make things happen, but not in a way that you're going to be offensive, obviously, to your employer, but you, you just find ways to work the gray and ensure that you can uh, achieve the goals that you have, perhaps as an individual, but also ensure that you're following the direction of council. Always. 
Great, thanks Ruth. And I, I know that you and your council worked so well together and that's probably what led to the awards for being the setting the culture for the workplace and, and also just creating that in, inspired environment to, or yeah, environment and culture to meet that that big target you had about being one of the, the greenest employers. So congratulations on that. Donna, over to you. Thanks. Um, again, going back uh, 10 years, um, I was part of a progressive uh, majority on council and, and we were, you know, many of us were really determined to get on the climate change action path. And um, our CAO was, I would say was generally supportive, um, but very cautious about um, the public response to those words, climate change. And uh, he argued that um, we didn't need to use those words, that we could get the actions we wanted without using that language. And so we had a bit of a struggle around that with, with around language and, and how to present. Um, we were working on a, an action plan for the community. Um, and the CAO, CAO who, was, um, who is an accountant, um, he argued for a cost savings approach. Like we're not doing it to save the planet, we're doing it to save money. And, um, and I, of course, wanted something bolder. I wanted to talk about the big issue and I wanted to, you know, really get busy saving the world and, you know, let's get, let's get on with it. Um, so in the end, uh, we, we compromised and we called our plan a low carbon path to 2040 uh, community energy and emissions action plan. So that plan was successful. It led, um, you know, to our, our um, um, eco save home retrofit program, which has has been very pop popular and has saved money for homeowners and but now 10 years later same CAO um, now the city has a climate change coordinator and the city is soon to release its new climate change action plan so you know sometimes these conflicts are just about timing and about language and um, and often it's about compromise and how how we move forward um, with integrity um, but also with everybody on board and and I, I think in the end it's worked really well and, and as society has moved forward and accepted this concept of climate change um, so has our ability to use those scary words. That's great and we know Nelson has been a real leader even way back when when you started the climate the climate change climate action I can't remember what the exact name was that initiative to now and I mean, you guys were very instrumental in getting the climate caucus started and i know at least there's one at least there's one counselor i mean there is at least one counselor from nelson um on this webinar so that's awesome yeah. um, i'm going to change this a little bit and keep um the panelists talking uh, donna and i'm just going to ask you to, to start off you guys have all alluded or talked to community support and community engagement and david talked about um about leadership and start, starting small and building that support. And I don't know if any of you have seen this, it's a bit of an old video, but it's called the, the Leadership Dancer. And it's, it's a guy at a folk festival and he's just out there dancing, looking really crazy until the second person joins and starts that. And then a whole mass of people join. And it's about creating a movement and that leadership might not necessarily be the first person trying to, to bring on crazy ideas. It's getting that second person or to follow that that's when real leadership and real momentum happens. So um, I, I was just thinking about that in the, in the conversation what you guys were talking about, but relating to community engagement. So Donna, can you give an example um, where you've had to overcome differences between um, CAO and council or even just among the council about community engagement and what did you do to make sure the community was engaged effectively and no one was left behind? Well isn't that the topic that we talk about every time <laughs> elected people get together is, uh, yeah. is community engagement and how that works and you know recognizing that there are many people in our communities who still adhere to the I'm going to vote every four years and the rest, you know, you guys just get on with it and, and I don't, I, you don't need to talk to me anymore. I already voted. But I think increasingly there, there's interest in, um, in being, in participating in the decision making. Um, 
I know that, you know, like many, like most cities, Nelson traditionally relied on public meetings and open houses and occasional survey and called that public engagement. But, you know, realistically, people who are living in poverty aren't likely to show up at City Hall for, a, for an open house on transit. And yet they're the ones most affected. So um, we've tried different things. At one point, I um, created a thing, um, a, a community group to look at ways to do public participation. And, um, and they came up with some really great ideas, but you know, they cost money, they take time, they take staff. And so um, didn't really move forward. Unfortunately, that was um, a piece of work that, you know, kind of hit the edge of the table and fell off because of other crises that were happening at the time. But, um, you know, during um, the last iteration of our official community plan, I really insisted that we needed to go where the people were and not just expect people to come to us and tell us things. So talk, you know, surveys on the bus, at the hockey game, at the grocery store, at the homeless shelter, really reaching out that way. And right now, um, through this development of our, of our climate change action plan, there was all kinds of engagement plan from focus groups to, um, to just sort of working groups coming together. But of course, with the pandemic, that all fell, to, fell off the table too. So, you know, um, technology has, has uh, resolved some of that. And so they've turned into a, a software program called Thought Exchange, which is quite helpful in, in getting input and tossing around ideas. It's not just, um, yes, I agree, no, I don't agree, but it's really, here's my ideas, and oh, that's an interesting idea. So it's really a way to, to get a synthesized um, public input rather than just opinions on a, on a piece of paper. So um, lots of challenges, but I think technology is, is a helpful tool, but it's not the only one we have. Right, and making sure that there is a virtual and when we're allowed in person and other ways to contribute. Yeah, absolutely. And Maya, maybe you can talk from your community and your experience, and especially if, if there are marginalized people in the community who don't tend to come out to provide input, how do you make sure everybody's engaged? Challenge right now, especially with COVID, uh, and I think going to to where the people are is is really important because they won't come up to municipal hall um, even you know during budget we're lucky at that time if two people showed up so you have the meeting during oh we must have it during the day and they'll come well no then one person showed up so have it at night and they'll all come they don't come there either uh, so this year our staff sent out just 100 surveys direct mail you know not junk mail but addressed to somebody to fill out and, and reply back so we've gotten a bit of a return what I find always has been interesting is to go and talk to the kids and so we started what we call city hall school and because um, young people uh, kindergarten and up would come and visit the fire hall so I would think why well, are they coming to see me well well no you can say hi but they're here to see the fire and I said okay well they should come and talk to me too so then we started dividing it up. So half the class would visit the fire hall, the other half would go through municipal hall, they would go up into chambers, they would have a debate. We try to make it relevant for the age group and the kids really like that a lot. So it started to spread and we made the offer to all the different schools. Some are in walking distance, one is a little further out. So then I would go to visit that school and you could always get in if you wanted to read to the kids. And so the teachers were always very accommodating and would make that time. So then we'd read the story and there would be the opportunity for questions. And because I guess bulletins would go home to parents notifying, uh, you would start to get feedback in different ways. So the kids would ask their questions, which are very direct uh, and very good questions. But then they would also offer, oh, my dad really wanted me to ask this or my mom <laughs> wants to know about that. So there's another audience there. Uh, and that's where I find it's a good way to engage with parents. So pre-COVID, I had talked to some of the principals that as we do our OCP planning, it would be great to have activities for the kids and then also to set something up in the gymnasium. So when parents were picking up their, their children, they could then also quickly pop into the school and get some more information. That is a very difficult demographic to meet our working parents because they just have so much on the go. 
So unfortunately, we weren't able to progress that, but our consulting team now is doing work in the schools right now to get some feedback and also um, girl guides and pathfinders. I'll be talking to a pathfinder group over Zoom in December and they're also very engaged. Um, scouts and the like, uh, even the Navy League will often reach out. And as long as you're willing to spend the time, it's a very dynamic um, audience. And I always encourage, and you know, the kids will ask, well, does anything I say matter? And I said, of course it does, like it's your future. So then within a week, I received a packet full of letters because they were all upset that the, of the garbage at one of the beach. And they're asked, was that a garbage can be installed? So we did that and I think it just reaffirms that every voice is important and you know I still love having all those letters that um, were sent to me. So I find like every community has different programs for young people and, and there's different ways where you can reach out to them and I think you'll be quite surprised that they'll be very interested in having elected officials speak about the work that we're doing and what our community is doing. Another quick example is one time we tried to charge for a volunteer RCMP police checks. Well, the girl guide showed up with boxes of cookies and said, if you did this, this is how many cookies we would have to sell. So please don't do that. And it was a very visual, okay, that's a lot of cookies and they always do a good job selling them, but really they're that the proceeds should go to the fun activities and not for something. And so they overturned both a staff and council decision in that particular moment. So our young people have a very powerful voice. We just need to remember to, to listen to them. Thank you. Girl guides and girl guide cookies. Very good visual. Um, have you ever dressed up as a fire chief? Okay, you don't have to answer that. <laughs> I'm going to move on to, to Ruth. <laughs> Ruth. Yeah, the um, probably one of the more successful engagements we had was actually on the sustainability, um, the visioning document. And the facilitator that we hired um, enabled it to be a lot about storytelling rather than engaging people on the actual subject. His, his line was to ask people where to tell stories about when they really enjoyed a park. And it, you know, not just in Ladysmith, um, anywhere in the world. And then extracted, we together um, extracted the elements of what that looked like. And of course, where we as humans feel most comfortable are going to be areas that are more sustainable. So it achieved the goal without in asking people to engage in what they may not be have been interested in initially. Um, and so the, there was a lot of um, people showed up at the meetings, but we also found that we heard some feedback that people wanted to come, but they couldn't for various reasons. And what we did was try to eliminate those barriers to people. So we had free babysitting and you know meetings in in the evenings meetings on the weekend and so I think it's really important just to be flexible um, you have your plan but um, all the way along ask questions about who isn't showing up and why and what can you do about it great and thank you for the reminder about stories and making it relevant for people because who wants to talk about sustainability exactly. they'd rather talk about stories that's great. Um, I'm going to turn the last question over to David to wrap us up and then we have a few qu interesting questions popping up. So David, maybe you can talk a bit about community engagement, but is there a distinct role between elected officials and CAOs and staff around community engagement? Who should be doing what and how do they work together? You know, there's actually a significant body of literature in public administration about what role do public servants have in a situation where um, there's a group of people in the community who are, uh, I don't think there's any other way to put it, there's, they're not able to speak for themselves. They're not organized. Um, I'm talking about people who uh, uh, homeless um, are uh, maybe dealing with addictions, they might be sex workers. For a variety of reasons, they are simply unable to organize themselves uh, and speak on their own behalf. To what extent uh, do public servants have a right or even an obligation uh, to make sure that council knows that there, uh, there's a group of people in our community 
who need uh, some assistance and who need, uh, you need to think about them, uh, Mr. and Ms. Counselor, uh, but they're not gonna be able to come to the table and make the case. I, when I do training sessions with uh, uh, staff, I sometimes ask the seemingly innocent question. I, be, I begin this discussion by asking the seemingly innocent question of who do you work for? And of course, the first question that all the staff will tell you is, I work for council. And then I say, well, but what if you have one of these issues in your community? Don't you work for your community as well? And then that raises a number of interesting uh, issues uh, about, uh, uh, about the extent to which they work for ob their obvious employer, council, and to what extent they have an obligation to their community and maybe to people in their own community who are not able to organize and speak very well for themselves. That's great insight. Thank you, David. I'm going to look at the questions that have, have come up. Um, the first one, I can't resist not trying to get this answered. So David, I'm gonna ask you to see if you can answer this one and then um, anyone else from the panel. So this person, I mean, if you can all see the questions and answer, so you know who it's coming from. But this person says, he spent his first term in a worst case scenario with a CAO who was a psychopath, where I could not trust the information that came from the CAO. Uh, the majority of council agreed that the individual should be fired for cause. However, it takes a super majority to do this. So it was eventually resolved, but the residue or the sentiment left behind is still being felt occasionally. So David, do you have any advice for council members who have or had similar situations where either there's such a, um, either they have a psychopathic CAO or there's, a, there's such a conflict that is being felt now or there's residual sentiment continuing to be felt? Well, in any organization, there are times when um, people have to part ways. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't, if the person was truly a psychopath and uh, was so difficult to get along with, then at, at some point, counsel just has to make the decision that uh, they have to part ways with, uh, uh, with that person. Um, if you don't want to part ways with that person for whatever reason, I don't think you need a super majority in BC to get rid of somebody doing in some provinces, um, but um, then what you start to do is you just work around the person and you can do it quite pointedly to uh, work around the person. And I've certainly seen this in organizations where uh, you'll work with department heads rather than uh, the CAO and at some point uh, uh, the message comes through. Mm, awkward. Um... Okay, let's leave it at that. And instead, the uh, Donna, Maya, and Ruth, instead of asking you guys because we're short on time, if you have any um, anything to share, could you just respond in the Q and A, and or we'll send it send it to me later, and I'll I'll send it out if you have any advice. But I want to turn to the next question and get each of you, Donna, Maya, and Ruth, to answer this very quickly in one minute each. Um, what would you say are the two most important characteristics or qualities of the participants in the council and CAO relationship? What are the two most important characteristics in that relationship? Um, let's start with Ruth. Oh, Ma Maya had a hand up. Ma Maya, go ahead. I'm gonna say um, respect and empathy. Like we're all people, we're all humans, right? So we all come with a different background, different expertise, different academia, whatever. And we just recognize that for one another, uh, that we're all here and, and to respect. And I think a good way to do it is, uh, and speaking to the other one is have, bring in lunch and just talk um, uh, and get to know each other as, as the humans that we are. And then you may pick up, well, gee, someone suffers from migraines and maybe you think they're not listening. They're just having a piercing headache. So cut them a bit of a slack there. Um, but it's always important. If you get into mudslinging, the whole thing goes downhill. It's just stay on the high road and be respectful. And in the end, you can look at yourself and, and, know, and know that you were respectful and was on the high road. Great, thank you. Ruth? Um, I would agree. 
And I would add um, trust is really, really important. And so you make any opportunity you can to build trust between um, the council and the CAO. Um, and willingness to learn from each other. Um, to coach each other and to, you know, take time to debrief after meetings and say, how did we do, you know, and, and be willing to accept that feedback from each other that, you know, perhaps you didn't phrase that very well, CAO, it sounded like you were saying this, that or the other, you know, just so when you have that trust, you can, you can learn and continue to do better. So important. Thank you. Donna? I, I agree with what, what everyone has said. I think that the whole notion of respect and civility is, is so important because we are all human beings doing the best we can. And I think, you know, finding ways to develop relationships with each other is really important. But there is a point where you move from kind of a professional relationship to a friendship, and that can make things tricky and especially I've, I've observed this between the CAO and the mayor they have a special working relationship they tend to work more closely together than council does with the CAO on a day-to-day -day basis and that can evolve I've seen that evolve into friendships and parties together and in the old days and uh, all, and that kind of thing and I think that's really there's a line there I think that has to be drawn um, in, in not getting really friendly but but treating each other um, with mutual respect and trust and empathy and all those good things. Thanks, Donna. And we could have a whole discussion about that fine line and what exactly is that fine line. But I want to iterate how important it is, the, the things that you talked about, respect and trust and, and, and just knowing a bit about each other. And um, I, I've done, a, I do a quite a bit of strategic planning for, for organizations and for local governments. And, I always want to spend the time to do a bit of the team building so that um, council and CAO together learn a little bit about each other, the commonalities, the fears, the uncertainties, their vulnerabilities, even as much as people can share. So to understand that each other is human and, and also what do we have in common? So that team building is really key because it's a relationship that will go four years for the most part or longer. So it's important to really build that relationship so that everyone's working together effectively. David, do you have one last parting word on um, that character, those characteristics? And then I'm gonna turn it over to Alex for some final words about the Climate Caucus. Uh, well, one of the thoughts that occurs to me when, when Donna was talking about that relationship between the mayor and the, and the CAO, in the trade, there's an expression about being friendly, but not friends. Okay, that's... Uh, uh, you know, you don't want to be standoffish and you do want to have empathy and understanding, but you, you can't be friends uh, across that, uh, that line. That's really important. Uh, you know, I appreciate you giving me a sort of semi-final word here. I can just uh, echo the words that other people have used, respect, tremendously uh, important. Um, and trust and those kinds of words are tremendously important in uh, uh, building a good relationship and having a good relationship between council and staff. So those, those are the words that are very important. Thank you, David. And thank you very much to all of you. That was, it was so great to hear from your, your wealth of experience. And uh, I really enjoyed um, this, being able to participate. So thank you. Alex, I'm gonna turn it over to you for a few words about the Climate Caucus. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. That was so amazing. And thank you to everyone who came to watch. Um, it was really informative. And I'd like to thank all the presenters. Um, so I just wanted to say a couple of words about Climate Caucus. Um, if you haven't already, I encourage you all to join Climate Caucus. Uh, we are a network of more than 250 locally elected leaders from across the country. And together, we are transforming how lo local governments are responding to the climate crisis. Um, I don't have a chat, so I will figure out how to drop a link to everybody when I finish talking. Um, 
So joining can be as simple as adding your name to our public list of members to help amplify our collective voice, which also means you get our bi-weekly newsletter with lots of resources and updates. Um, if you're interested in getting more involved, we have a regular network calls where you can learn about what other local electeds are working on and connect with others. Um, we have working groups that are investigating specific research questions, and we are looking for volunteers to take on leadership roles across the organization. So our next electeds only caucus call is on November 19th at 11 a.m. Pacific and 2 p.m. Eastern and we will feature a discussion about what we wish we knew when we were first elected so that we can better support some of our newly elected folks in the future. So I hope to see you there and don't forget to join us now. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone.